Why seven? Good morning and happy new year 2021. Thank you for joining us for Trinity Briefing, our first one of the year. Uh, this is the program that was launched in April of 2020 in response to small and minor businesses seeking information on how to survive, if not thrive, in the COVID-19. Since then, we have pivoted to provide information to the small and minority community, as well as vested nonprofit organizations. Again, my name is Stephen Turner. It's my pleasure to introduce the creator of the Community Briefing, uh, one of the co-moderators who would also introduce our other moderator, Crystal Mitchell. Crystal. Uh, thank you guys. Welcome. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, we hope you had a wonderful, safe uh, holiday season. Got some rest. I did. I slept through most of it uh, and, I, and I realized I needed it. And I am glad and happy that we're all here to um, um, be, continue our works for 2021, making sure that our communities are healthy and thriving. Um, I am the co-director of Recycling Black Dollars. I also host another uh, podcast called The Business Zone, uh, which air broadcasts live every Friday afternoon at three o'clock. And uh, I just kicked off another one during the holiday called uh, Conversations on the Patio with uh, Javon and Christo, and it's about retirement and planning for your retirement. Um, so excited about that one as well. Uh, I am happy to have my co-host, Miss Robin Billups, and my other co-host, he's joined us, Gregory Sneed. So I'm going to let uh, Robin introduce herself, and then we'll let Greg in uh, introduce himself, and we'll kick it off. Happy New Year, guys. And again, as we launch into this new 2020, just remember 2021, I'm sorry, 2021 is a seven year. Seven is a complete number in the Bible. That's what I believe in. And I'm excited about um, where we're going. We, we, we have to continue to be positive about this because we are the surviving race. You know, we are the creators. We, you know, the, we were put here to create. And so the business briefing gives us an opportunity to provide resources, information and insight and guidance in order for you to be able to get off of these calls and go and implement something. So, and then the other thing that we ask you to do is help us grow our audience because we know that the information that we provide is critical information, is relevant information, it's good information, especially if you're looking to grow and create um, generational wealth, economic imp impairment, and you know, kill the disparities that we deal with on a regular basis. And we're so excited to have Pacific Coast Regional to join us weekly and provide these updates that are so critically important because usually by the time we get the information, the deadline is tomorrow. But the beautiful thing is that PCR gets this information early on and they're willing to come on weekly with us now and to provide that information. So we're excited about Colette being here today and hi to the team. All right, Mr. Gregory. Hello, my name is Gregory Sneed and I am a financial uh, consultant and starting this month now a uh, financial coach. So I've launched a new business, Financial uh, Lifesaver Financial Services, and be offering uh, personal financial coaching to individuals and uh, small business owners. I'm originally from uh, Brooklyn, New York, and have been living here in Los Angeles uh, a couple of times, but I've been here for about 11 years now and excited about all the wonderful things and opportunities we have in our community. So thank you for joining us on the call today. Okay, so with that, this, this platform is to inform us and keep us informed of what's going on in our community. And we're going to, with that, turn it over with our, our, our wonderful partner, PCR, and she's going to update us on what transpired as of December 18th to January 7th. And a lot has taken place far as the CARES Act. And so she's going to uh, bring us up current while we wait for uh, the assembly member, um, Camilla. Camilla Jiller. And happy new year, everyone. I am gonna be able to share screen in a moment. I don't have all of the details, but we have resources to get some of the details for you all. There is a lot going on in Washington and this has been going, <laughs> there's just a lot going on, but a lot that really will affect our, um, our community as well. So for those um, that are not familiar, familiar with uh, PCR and the SBDC, PCR has been 
working in the community to help underserved um, small businesses sent for over 40 years and uh, have been a partner with the SBDC, the Small Business um, Development Centers for about 10 years, being able to help everyone. And so our role is to help businesses to start, grow, survive <laughs> this pandemic and all the other drama that we have faced uh, over the last year and several years and to, to grow. We want our businesses to be able to thrive in this community. And so that means as Robin, um, we're saying we have to be informed. So I just wanted to give a brief update on some of the stimulus package information and what people will need to do actually to prepare. And so um, the first thing is the IDLE and the PPP. These are the two very, very large um, programs that came out in what we'll call the first wave of the stimulus package. And so the idle is continuing to stay open. It initially was scheduled to close at the end of December. It remains open until December 31st, 2021, mm -hmm. or of course, until funds are depleted. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, but the second one that is very um, important is the PPP. And so the PPP, that's the Paycheck Protection Program, is really critical. Applications are expected to open back up in, um, it says the 8th, but nobody's gotten the information, full information yet from the um, SBA. But we're hearing it's going to be Monday when the PPP opens back up. And that means that the banks will reopen for the Paycheck Protection Program. So details are forthcoming, but that means that you, um, as a business, need to get ready. You need to get your documents ready. You need to be ready to participate in all of these funding activities. And so that's the key. It's not just hearing about it. Um, I think I heard the word doing something. And for the businesses here on this call, it is about getting, getting your businesses ready and getting your documents in order so that you can participate in the funding. PPP is critically important to our communities because with all of these funds, we are competing with other states and other cities for funding that comes back into our community. So we have to go after this money. We have got to go after this money. And um, African-American businesses, people of color, you have got to go after this money. It helps the community because of the low rates. It will allow businesses to survive. And the PPP is one that's basically like free money. And so, um, because if you get your money back by, um, and getting the forgiveness, it is like free money. And so, and we're expecting with the people that um, we've been able to help that most of the businesses will get at least like 80 to 100% forgiven. And so um, it's a really clear reason. It is free money into our communities. We have to fight for it and we have to go after it. So in terms of the stimulus package, um, there are a couple of things that are, have changed since the first one. So they're calling this stimulus package 2.0. If for the PPP, you can get a second draw that is allowable. Um, I see Greg, <laughs> Gregory pumping his fist there. So that means more money um, for the businesses. Um, there is no longer that risk of a tax liability. With the first round, there had been some concern that once it was forgiven, that you would be taxed on it, but that um, is not going to happen. So the, the tax has been removed. There's a 3.5 times your revenue for NACE 72. And NACE 72 is kind of a, um, a, a NACE code that covers um, entertainment and um, those types of, of restaurants and things like that. So it's a little bit more money for those types of businesses. Then there is simplified application process. That's what we're expecting. Hopefully simplified forgiveness. They did that in the first version for businesses under um, 150,000. And then that idle advance is actually fully a grant now. If you had the PPP in the idle, it was very confusing last time. It's like, is it a grant? No, it now goes into the PPP. And is it anyway, it was very confusing, but now that is truly a grant. Um, or will be a grant going forward, not for the past rounds. Um, the idle again is extended until uh, December of this year. 
And there is a new advance that's going out for low income areas. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, the previous advance is now a grant. So sorry about that. That is the idol. Then there are a couple of other things that the legislature has put in there, uh, including employee, employer tax credits, depending on the number of employees that you have. SBA loan forgiveness has been extended um, up to $9,000 for uh, additional eight months. And there is going to be a, a grant for um, live venues. And so there's more information coming on that. So stay connected, stay part of this group. And I, we have some training. So as we get more information, we'll be providing that. But the key thing is to make sure that you get your documents ready and in order. So the Paycheck Protection Program is still at a low um, rate. Um, Two million is the cap. Remember though, it, the in the first round after so many large companies got it, they capped it at 150 grand, even though there were companies that were eligible for more that were not the large companies. So hopefully those, com those businesses that are slightly larger and are able to get more money will be able to um, do that. Then I wanted to make sure for those of you that did get the first round of PPE, we are PPP, we are still training on the loan forgiveness. So we have a workshop today at um, two o'clock. We do that, every, we're doing that every Thursday. In addition to every Wednesday, um, we're going through the details of the application process. So as we get more information, every Wednesday, we're going through the, the applications and you know, any hints, tips, things that you need to do that are more detail oriented um, than we have time for here. Then here's the idol. So I did just check this link is still, um, or uh, this website is still the same for the idol. So that's covid19relief.sba.gov. So please go on. And um, if you have questions, make sure that you can get some help. And then just remember the idol still continues to be a very good loan um, when you compare it to like standard SBA. Um, you know, the rates are low, maturity is 30 years, it's deferred for a year, there's no, limited collateral required, no personal uh, guarantees, zero processing fees, which can really take a loan, um, take a, a big chunk out of a loan sometimes. And so just continue to consider those. Then um, one thing that is happening now is the California relief grant. If you have not applied for that, you should. So I want to know, put, put a little thumb in there if you have already applied for this grant. Your business, have you already applied for this grant? The California relief grant. Okay, thank Bianca, you're always on it. So, okay, I see one. <laughs> thank you, Bianca. Um, this is a grant, uh, 510 and, or 515 and $25,000 grant. It closes on next Wednesday, the 13th. It is open for uh, for-profit and non-profit. We are hosting a, uh, another webinar for it on Friday. Um, you can go in, work on it, go to the um, careliefgrant.com. It's not that easy to find this. So that just remember to make a note of that and I'll put it into the chat when I am done and um, make sure to apply for this, for this grant. And there is, um, you know, it's allowable. You, there, um, you have all these allowable expenses, but there is a component here that is set aside, it's not a set aside, but there is some priority. So it is a lottery system, but there's priority for certain zip codes. There's priority for certain types of businesses of which many of you are on this call might qualify. So take a moment, you'll need some things on here. There's a lot of information on the website. Before you submit though, if you have any questions, it's a great time to get them in our call tomorrow. So you have an opportunity to ask questions and I'll put that in the, um, in the chat as well. But please make sure that you apply for this grant. You cannot get the money if you are not playing, have to play. Got to be in the game and got to put your money, um, put your information in there um, to apply. And this is a big grant, five, half a billion dollars half a billion dollars. So, you know, we were encouraging everybody to get the LA COVID fund grant. That was great. The city, you know, wonderful and all the benefactors there, but this is half a, half a billion dollars 
we, you are competing though with people around the state. So let's get your information in right now. Last other one is this is People of Color Grant. So this is one that PCR has with um, Wells Fargo, um, very uh, good rate and then way, fees are subsidized as well. There is a general one, it's not quite as good as this one, but it's still a very strong grant with up to $50,000. So um, we encourage you to participate in that one. So I just wanna say, get ready, get help. There is money available for our community. So do what you need to do to get ready. Consult your accountant and bookkeeper. How many, are there any bookkeepers on the, on the line? Any accountants, bookkeepers? Yeah, Crystal. If you're an accountant and bookkeeper, Crystal. Put your name in the chat. <laughs> Crystal, all right. Crystal. So accountants and bookkeepers, this is one of the biggest issues that our community has faced is that people don't have their records together. So, you know, there's all this, oh, do I have to have my 2019? Yes, if you're a business, you got to have your 2019 taxes. Um, and you want to have 2020 because there's, you need to do a comparison for some of these grants. So it may help if you have your taxes ready. Um, so we encourage you to get your taxes ready um, and make sure everything is in good order. Get your financial statements ready and in good order. And for all of these documents, particularly like the PPE, the PPP, um, go through the document checklist. It is online and then we're teaching that as well on Wednesdays. But go to your document checklist and start getting your documents ready. Again, get them ready so that you can be first in line. Because if you guys remember, money ran out for the PPP. And then I heard a lot of our clients coming in saying, oh, I want the PPP. That thing closed like two months ago. We need to be in there early and we need to get our applications in to get the appropriate funding. So um, get your paperwork organized, including your payroll, and then get your money back. Okay, when it's time to with those PPE loans. Last thing, this is um, some of the resources that we have upcoming and you can find it at pcrsbdc.org backslash workshops. I'll put those several things in the chat and um, thank you for the time. And I hope that everyone on this call are listening um, and has an opportunity to apply for these funding options to help your business and get the money that's available. So thank you guys. Thanks, Crystal. Thank you, Colette. And if you can send me over the PowerPoint, that would be fantastic. I can get it out to everyone. And in, in addition to that, I will be uh, um, running a, a class on, I'm teaching a class at uh, um, Vermont Slauson uh, in two weeks, uh, understanding accounting. And then I'm going to have a class that I'm going to be running um, called uh, teaching you how to use WAVE as an accounting software program so you can get your financials together. And then probably in the month of February, I'll be teaching a class on QuickBooks. It's a, it's a 12 week program. So for everyone to get their financials together, mm -hmm. as Colette just said, even for the grants, you can't get past that PL. Got to have that PL. All righty, so we are, our, our guest is here, we're excited. And uh, so we're gonna turn it over to Gregory so he can introduce her and we can get started with hearing all the great stuff from the state of California. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, good morning still everyone and afternoon for those on the East Coast. Um, please uh, join us with, uh, we are going to be uh, joined with assembly member Sydney Kamlanger. She represents the 54th Assembly District, encompassing Baldwin Hills, the Crenshaw community, all of Culver City, Ladera Heights, Lamert Park, Mar Vista, Mid City, Los Angeles, Palms, Pico Union, Westwood, and Windsor Hills. That's a large area. In 2020, uh, she passed the Assembly Bill 1950, which was the most transformative probation reform legislation in the country and it set a maximum term of two years for felony offenses and one year for misdemeanor offenses. Uh, in 2019, she was able to guide six of her eight bills into law. Very good. As chair of the Select Committee on Incarcerated Women, Kamlager is focused on reviewing and reforming policies to support the health, dignity, and rehabilitation of women in prison. She also sits on the Assembly Public Safety Committee and the Speaker Rendon Select Committee on Police Reform. She also serves on Governor Newsom's Penal Code Revision Committee. 
She was born and raised in Chicago, Chi Town, and she moved to Los Angeles and attended the University of Southern California, where she got her bachelor's degree in political science, and she joined Zeta Phi Beta Sorority. Yeah, I'm an alpha. <laughs> she earned her master's degree in arts management and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. So please join us in welcoming Assembly Member Sydney Kamlanger. Thank Welcome. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Colette. Happy New Year to you all. And uh, Gregory, I know all about AFIA. My uh, husband, Mr. Dove, um, is uh, a proud member. So I, I get a lot of black and gold love at home. <laughs> Happy New Year to you all. I was, um, it was great for me to hear the um, earlier uh, conversation because you are sharing important, important um, information about what is coming out over the state. And um, if we could replicate this across all of the counties and districts in the state where black folks have businesses and are represented, I would probably be able to sleep much better at night. I also want to recognize um, a shout out to anybody from uh, the Midwest. Uh, my, my grandmother's people came from East St. Louis. So woo -woo. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Um, so happy 2020. One, um, <clears throat> yesterday was crazy. It's unfortunate that that was um, what took up all of the mind space for folks instead of allowing us to have a little more time to celebrate and recognize the ferociousness that is Stacey Abrams and how she was able to really deliver um, Georgia to us so that we could reclaim the Senate and our sanity um, mm -hmm. as we move into 2021. And one of the reasons why that is incredibly important is because the di disastrous effect that COVID has had on all communities, but especially communities of color and black communities, has um, been a result of the either the lack of coordination coming out of the federal administration or the intentional coordination mm -hmm. uh, that was used to leave us out um by the federal administration i think there's there's um you know i'm really curious as to why you know 95 percent of the ppp money went to non-black um, businesses you can't tell me that that was just an oversight and so it's one of the reasons why it was so important for georgia to um, swing our way is so that at least we know we have a friend and for any aka's on the on this uh call you better yes call the new vice president elect and remind her um that it's important that we're focusing on covid and the public health catastrophe that it has brought, but it is equally important that we talk about COVID from an economic standpoint and look at how disastrous it has been to small businesses, especially small businesses of color. So last year, um, <clears throat> we had a very strange legislative session. We came to uh, the Capitol um, with the focus being on housing and homelessness, and it quickly shifted to COVID and how to deal with this pandemic we are still sort of dealing with it because now we have a vaccine but we also have a surge in numbers especially in los angeles county which seems to be the epicenter of this last year we went up i recall in march and we um, approved a 1.2 billion dollar allocation to the governor around covid most of it was dedicated to health and human service is resources that we needed and quickly we realized, or quickly they realized, um, that we were also gonna have to provide support to small businesses. So as a result, there were two relief programs that the state created. I, you mentioned one of them um, with the uh, COVID relief grant where the state allocated $500 million, um, which would um, offer up to $25,000 to small businesses and nonprofits. There was also um, the Main Street tax credit um, that was passed last year uh, that would provide up to $100,000 of relief to small businesses through a hiring credit. And you can request the credit on the tax and fee administration administration's website up until January 15th, which I think is about maybe a week and a half away. That website is cdtfa.ca.gov. And we will also, um, I can put that in the chat for you. I did not know that Senator Warnock uh, is an alpha, but I will, I'm sure my husband knows. So thank you, Gregory, for that update. 
The other thing that we did last year was allocate $50 million to the iBank, which is essentially the state's bank. Um, and so for those small businesses and nonprofits that were unable or unable to access or ineligible for PPP funding or did not get it, um, you could apply to the iBank. Uh, which is a non-traditional lending institution that's really sort of subsidized and run by the by the state government. And they, excuse me, we allocated $50 million into that pot for COVID relief. And you go to their website, which is ibank.ca.gov to access um, that funding. We'd work to share that information with our chambers, with our ethnic chambers, and with those um, community groups that um, either act as associations or facilitators um, to nonprofits and small businesses to get that information to them. And we will be working to sort of re-up that financial ante this year. Lastly, the governor has uh, stated that he is pledging, I think it's $4.5 um, billion for equitable recovery for California's businesses in this 2021 budget. We are expected to go back up to Sacramento January 11th. Um, I think the goal is to vote on a number of these budget items um, so that we can get money out as quickly as possible to small businesses across the state. My expectation is that before the end of the month, we will be voting on um, an extension of our eviction moratorium bill um, that we will be looking at funding to support uh, rent and landlord relief, um, and that we will be working to um, <clears throat> approve this budget request so that we can get $25,000 um, grants out to small businesses uh, for this equitable recovery. I think it <sighs> has been, I mean, I can't even tell you all the words that are in my head about how we have had to brave 2020 um, and how black and brown communities have sort of been thrown under the bus with whatever sort of topic you want to raise. And we also know that um, there are just so many challenges with starting small businesses and maintaining them and growing them. It's everything from just having um, the ability to tap into generational wealth to the um, discriminatory practices that we have to manage through with regards to credit and accessing credit and financial institutions with sort of braving the challenges of managing cash flow when you're working with vendors like state and county and local jurisdictional vendors um, where the reimbursements don't come as quickly as they need to or come with all of the red tape um, to trying to be a good um, employer and, and working with um, your employees to keep them on board um, to all of the challenges that come when you're struggling to survive and knowing that if you close the doors, it's not as easy as just shutting them down for about four days or four weeks or four months and then opening it back up as if nothing ever happened. And so uh, as a as vice chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus, that's something that we have been stressing to this governor um, since the beginning of COVID because we recognize that so many of our black businesses are not just small, although they are not all small, but many of them are iconic um, and are really important to the communities that they serve and in which they're housed. And we know that once they close, it will be very hard for them to reopen. I will also tell you that we, um, there are challenges uh, with the legislature when it comes to, um, I guess, tensions between, tensions might be too strong a word, but tensions between business and labor, but really an, an, a misunderstanding of um, regulations and the burdens that some regulations offer to small and micro businesses. And, and, and as we're trying to make sure that we're creating a more equitable California, also recognizing that some of the um, requirements that we place on businesses disproportionately impact small businesses, folks that may not have HR support or in-house HR support or even in-house legal support. And so how do we work um, to offer a better coordination of, of, of um, 
reviewing legislation, making sure that they don't disproportionately impact small businesses, making sure that there are sort of opportunities for education, outreach, and compliance so that we can have, you know, a healthy uh, revenue base that includes businesses that actually want to be here. Um, so last thing I will just say um, is COVID and the vaccine. I think there's actually something happening today on Facebook Live about Black folks and, vac and the vaccine and things you need to know. Uh, I, Dr. Fauci is going to be on that. It's, I think it's also co-hosted by the Lynx and the Divine Nine and a number of other nonprofit organizations. Dr. Carlisle and a number of other experts um, will be on there talking about what Black folks need to know about COVID and the vaccine. Um, we have a rollout plan. We are in um, 1A now. There are tiers 1A, 1B, 1C, 1A essential workers frontline workers, healthcare workers, 1B, um, elderly, sick, congregate care, pre-existing conditions, 1C, sort of non-essential everyone else's. You can tell from the news, it's been sort of a cluster with regards to how folks are, you know, uh, getting the vaccine and how it's been distributed across the state. I was actually on a call earlier today about that. Um, I will say that they, there seemed to be a number of folks that were tone deaf um, regarding the skepticism that folks have around vaccinations in general mm -hmm. and this one. Mm -hmm. And I think people thought that if you just threw somebody with a PhD next to their name and they told you to get the vaccine that everybody was going to say, okay. And we tried to tell them that that was not going to happen, especially in our black communities. And so now here we are. Uh, we do know that the lowest threshold number <clears throat> for herd immunity is 60%. Where we need to be is more like 75. Um, we need to figure out how to get there um, without sort of forcing folks um, who, who, who just need a little more information. Um, but the goal is to get there um, so that we can manage our way through so that we don't have to continue to deal with the whiplash of closings and reopenings without the kind of support that businesses need. So I think with that, I will stop um, and answer any questions. How will the Prop 22 impact jobs in California is a question. I actually forgot what Prop 22 was. There were so many propositions on the ballot. Gregory, which one was that? Dialysis? Uber. No, that's on. That's the Uber one. That's the Uber and uh, DoorDash and, um, you know, the, the contractors, contractors, the gig industry. Yes, yes. So that one um, didn't pass. So um, I, I will tell you that um, um, so it's not going to have, obviously, the concern was if it was passed that it would impact um, jobs in those gig economy industries um, in sort of like the delivery transport world. Um, it didn't pass. And so actually, now I think the discussion is using the, oh, it did pass. No. No, it did not pass. Yeah, it, it did pass. not pass. Mm -hmm. Um. So I think now the discussions are about what this, how this illustrates this issue and paths forward for states across the country. Um, um, you know, there were a lot of things that didn't pass this past November um, that are giving people a pause. I have to say that I don't know especially in light of what we're facing with sort of reopenings and COVID and schools and learning um, and distance learning, if this will rise up um, to a priority one when we return um, back to the legislature. You know, this was sort of the last gas as a result of AB5 that was passed um, and that has proven to not be as to be as problematic as folks said it was going to be during those discussions. Um, and so what we will probably see is a continued rollback of AB5 
um, to provide extensions and exemptions for so many of the folks that have been sort of caught up in the web of AB5 that don't really um, deserve to be there. So um, um, I hope that answered your question, but we're not anticipating that it will impact any jobs because it didn't because it didn't pass. I think the larger issue is just if folks are able to stay in business. I guess also um, a number of those companies, especially because that's that's about them changing their whole business model, um, and yeah. and and then of course putting millions of people back out uh, on the street with no jobs because at this point that is how they're making a living. I have noticed uh, that there's been an increase in prices so that they can. Um, uh, absorb the cost of having to pay payroll taxes and so forth and so on. But I am happy to hear that though anyone else that works as an independent contractor that's truly an independent contractor are not going to get caught up in the murk of the AB5 because it, it was pretty broad, um, a broad spectrum. Uh, 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 Assemblywoman, my question is, is on the uh, unemployment, the EDD. We, so we, we talked about the CARES Act and so forth, but there are a number of individuals that uh, their benefits uh, discontinued as of December 26. And I, I'm not quite sure what's going on at the EDD from the state level, <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff going on there. And in addition to all of the fraud that took place and everybody's caught up in that as well. So how is there... How do we get move forward? When are the benefits going to start back again? Um, and I guess the, the federal piece of it as well. And do they have to re um, uh, re register in order to get that? So uh, we actually were. I was on a call last night with EDD, uh, and it, I didn't even need to turn on the heat in the house. It was so hot on the Zoom. Um, you know, to you. say that it's a hot mess is actually an understatement. Um, where to begin? So we were uh, granted an approval for four point five billion dollars towards the end of the year to allow us to offer extended benefits to those who had seen their um, UI benefits exhausted, and that was um, uh, for an additional three hundred dollar a week supplemental. Um, we are probably going to go back. Um, I think everyone was sort of waiting for the Biden administration to get certified and to have them come on so that we'll have some better allies with us while we're negotiating new stimulus uh, packages that actually give support to states and counties. So this last round actually, because um, uh, Trump doesn't like states and counties or doesn't like states that don't like him or whatever, um, none of the money was going to the states and to the counties. And so that's obviously funding that the state would have been able to use um, to even grant more or extended UI benefits. We have partnered this, let me just not we, the state, but I guess I am part of the we, but the governor manages unemployment and EDD. Uh, they entered into an agreement with Bank of America um, and it's drama, dramas, dramas with these um, debit cards that have been loaded and then frozen with hacking um, and fraud. Um, and um, so I don't even want to get on my soapbox about that. We are, they are, they have been asked by the legislature to fix some of the BS that is happening through <clears throat> EDD because they are asking folks to re-register and so we're actually like managing caseload for EDD in my office because they are so slow and folks who have already gone through the me ID and have their information in the system shouldn't be asked to re-register. And yet in many instances, that is what is happening. They did not know that was happening. We had to tell them that is happening. So they are working to fix it. They also are working to address the dramas that are happening with B of A um, that contract is expected to expire i think at the end of the month and there's getting they're getting a lot of pushback um even from including from me about um um whether or not to re-engage with bank of america or to end that contract now i will tell you that they have loaded up these cards um with the state's money 
and then frozen the cards and are still collecting interest on the cards that they are not giving out to people. I have asked what that number is. Everybody looked at me and had their eyeballs roll back, but I'm still asking for that money because it makes no sense to me that you have this huge um, institution taking our money, earning money off of our money, and then not giving our money out. Um, so they know that they have a cluster there. They have brought a new director on to manage through that. She got an earful for an hour and a half last night, um, but we are pushing them to reconcile these grievances because now many of us who have, you know, that have staff, we actually have a dedicated person who's now become an EDD representative um, to help make sure that claims are getting addressed. Sydney, hey, it's Robin Billups. I put a question in the chat box and, and my concern is this. Um, we, there, we keep hearing about supplier diversity and uh, compliance needed to diversify the supply chain with these major corporations, even with the government. And uh, we always hear about what the small business can do, what they need to do, what they need to make sure that they have, blah, 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 blah. blah. My contention is how, can, instead of hosting these how to do business with XYZ company, why couldn't XYZ host an event to help these small businesses understand their process better, you know, focused on procurement in particular? And so my question is, how can we support you? Because I know, you know, I, I heard you speak at the GLAC C-Suites, um, uh, Women in the C-Suite, and you were so on point, so um, upfront and very, very candid. And I really, really, really appreciated that. And that's why we wanted to invite you on. And we'd like to create a partnership with you, an ongoing partnership with you, because we know you will bring us some good information. But, but a lot of our constituents are business owners. And, they, and a lot of these companies have been around for a minute. And yeah, like with any other company, sometimes there are things that fall through the cracks. But when you have people who are ready, to do business with these companies and cannot get an audience with the right individual, what can we, how can we, what, what kind of support can we look for? Because this group here is willing to put it, put it out in the public and give folks direction and support that they need. Pacific Coast Regional and some other organizations, I'm a consultant, a lot, a lot of us are prepared to help these folks be ready. But if they go through all of that and they got all of the certifications and, and now they cannot get to the prime supplier who's controlling the contract on behalf of these major companies. How do I know? I, I entered supplier diversity in 2006. And in 2007, I started to use it in the word supply chain inclusion because that's what it's supposed to be. And so I'm gonna be quiet because I, you know, I, I, I get myself worked up about this kind of stuff. <laughs> Well, go on and get worked up because I'll be getting worked up with you. That's why you're here. <laughs> I'll get I worked saw up you worked you. up. I'm like, I hello, love it. Hello. So I saw that Debbie Lumpkin is on the call and yes. I could be missing something, but I know Black Caucus worked really hard to make sure that she um, was appointed to her position. And it was about diversity and inclusion with our SB1 dollars, which is a huge bucket of money focused on transportation. The Black Caucus has been incredibly um, so the Black Caucus has been focused on uh, Black business and procurement. We have a great chair in um, Steve Bradford, who comes from both the conservation world, but also the utilities and commerce world and the business world um, as our new chair. And I, I think led the charge to, to make sure that we got a, a sister appointed to that position and uh, make sure that it was uh, Ms. Lumpkin specifically. Mm -hmm. And so um, as vice chair, he and I have been talking um, and this is something that we, um, you know, one of the pillars of the Black Caucus, there are two pillars, one is Black education, but the other is um, Black business and Black economics. And so we're sort of working on our plan for 2021 as new leadership um, as it relates to black business. So I would actually love to let him know that I got the charge from y'all um, to get going um, and to come back to you all to say how we can work together and partner 
um, because we have been really forceful with the administration about thinking outside of the box when it comes to sharing information. You know, they tend to think that black folks, you know, go to this one church or participate in this one chamber or, you know, go to this one particular restaurant. And if you just go there and talk to like those three people, then all of black California will get the information. <laughs> and so like, no, that's not true. And the groups that you may be working with are not necessarily the groups that are on the ground sharing the information that have the trust or have a flexible nuanced network that they can get the information out. So, you know, listen to a sister, she kind of know. <laughs> so uh, we're actually, so Bradford and I have been talking about this and um, there's also been conversations about how to have a statewide procurement portal um, you know, this was also part of the discussion around Proposition 16, which failed because California seems to still not want Black folks to get ahead or just to have some equality when it comes to, you know, being part of the procurement discussions. And so because that is still in place, we still have to be creative in how we figure things out. But I would actually love to take this back, not only to Bradford, but in the next conversations we have with the governor's office to say, see, I told you so. Um, and here are some people that you need to be engaged with directly. Um, because you can have a conversation about social justice all day long. If you're not talking about economics, then you really are not talking about Correct. social justice. And I have told everyone that the lens through which we need to be looking at solutions for our social issues has to be the economic lens. It goes through housing, it goes through education, it goes through criminal justice, it goes through healthcare, you know, it goes through, you know, community, uh, public safety and survival. So if you're not talking about people's paper, then you're not talking yeah. about nothing. Um, so if you, if you would allow me, I would love to be able to take this back to Mr. Bradford and to um, the, our um, legislative working group with the governor's office and then come back to you all with some real sort of opportunities and ask. That's wonderful. That, that would be wonderful. fantastic. And also, you know, maybe our voices, our letters, our, our emails, our voices, we, we, we can, all of us represent an organization. I represent uh, Recycling Black Dollars. Um, we have a, a big voice in our community. Uh, um, Steven represents the BBA. So if it requires that, uh, we've actually put together a task force so that we can do exactly that. We wanna get our word out and our message out and to hear from us, the people that are the result of whatever decisions are being made that but they never ask us what we really need. They just kind of throw out something out there and, and then it never gets to us in the first place. So uh, however we can do that, we are here to do that. <laughs> Amen. Well, you know, we're, we're so past this whole check the box syndrome, right? And, and, um, and people, the, the mission of this weekly briefing is for people to leave here with some stuff that they can go and do. You know, what can we, once you hear this information, what can you plug into? What, what resources are available to you? How to utilize those resources and ask the hard questions within this um, comfortable environment where we can go and get any kind of subject matter expert. But in doing that, it's not just a commercial. You know, it really is a call to action. And so I, Debbie Lumpkin is on here. Well, she's a sweetheart. She's one of my dearest friends. And Debbie, can you maybe take yourself off of mute? We're, we're, we're just going to give you a few minutes to say hello. And Debbie's going to be coming back. She's going to be doing a presentation for us in the near future. Um, but Debbie, please take it. Take well, no, thank you, Robin, so much for um, inviting me today and, and letting me know about it. Um, right when um, the assembly member mentioned my name, I was taking like a big bite of barbecue. I was like, oh, my God. Let me <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I'm really um, I'm really glad to, to listen in the conversation and also hear about what PCR SBDC as far as uh, giving out the loans. It helps me kind of in my walk of life to be able to continue to share that information. Um, I also, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention like all the support the California Black Caucus and all the diverse caucuses have given me kind of in my role. Um, it's, you know, it, it helps me in um, knowing I have a sounding board, knowing I have a voice and it, it helps make my stick a little bit bigger sometimes when I need it. Um, but just in, for those of you that don't know, um, I'm the Deputy Inspector General of Diversity. Um, we we have 
I work for the Inspector General. We have oversight over the California Department of Transportation. Kind of um, the shortest way to explain my role and um, is that I am in I have oversight over racial equity in hiring and contracting um, at the California Department of Transportation. So um, kind of just to give you a, just a quick snapshot of kind of what's going on in that role and especially with transportation and the SB1 dollars um, that have been going out and the projects that are going on. Um, I'm going on, I think my third year in the role. And I would say at about the second year is where I started to see major transformational changes. And, you know, as you know, um, when there's leadership changes or strong leadership that truly understand the issues of equality and equity and also having some maybe personal experience with it, it's really helped um, to kind of help move the needle. Um, so the organization has done, put in motion a lot of equality and equity efforts in teams, and it really helps to enhance me being able to do my job. It's turned into where I, I do a lot of advising and consulting, and I make sure um, they understand the voice of the community. So that's why I like to participate too in seminars like this so that I can go back and you know give them the information of where the issues are. So I, I'm not saying that everything's perfect there, but um, there has been, I think, tremendous movement since um, the major leadership changes as far as the head of Caltrans. And we also have a pretty much new leadership team in the Office of Civil Rights. Um, they also brought on um, this year, well, 2020, they brought on a new uh, female that's in charge of their equal opportunity department. Um, and so I'm very pleased with all of them and they work very well with me. And um, we're able to, I think, you know, um, leverage all the roles to really make a difference. Mm -hmm. So I expect great things moving forward, but it, it's gonna take a while. It's that doesn't happen in a vacuum. But um, just to something else that was mentioned earlier, um, and I'm the co-chair for the One LA Initiative. And it's something that as soon as I heard about it, it's just like such a no brainer. I've you know, been a business owner myself. I've been in the supply of diversity space since 2009. And there's just, there's so many opportunities, so many certifications, so many rules, you know, depends on the funding source. And, you know, now that I'm even more deep in this public sector, um, there's so many contracting laws. I mean, there's a state contracting law, then you have the federal programs, the state programs, the money gets mixed, this happens, um, you know, the review boards. I mean, it's, it's a lot. Um, so as much as all that can be centralized, makes it easier for the business as far as from a knowledge base and just from a time perspective. And so, you know, one of the big things that um, the LA Chamber um, as part of the One LA Initiative is that single platform, that single database. Um, it's where you can go get certified and say you're doing certification for one application. It'll tell you, well, you're 50% done doing this other one too. Do you want to finish it? So it just, it makes everything like a one-stop shop. And I know everybody has their own databases and um, processes. And so this model lets you plug and play however you want. Like if you have a database or a place where you put your procurement opportunities, you can still share them on this site as well. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of different ways to play, but it's definitely something I think um, uh, solutions like that is what we need to look into, especially with you got, you know, the Olympics and all these different contracting opportunities coming up the more centralization um, of certification and contracting opportunities that, you know, the better we'll be able to get our folks engaged. The challenges, I think, just to add to what Ms. Lumpkin talked about is that, you know, we're always being asked to both be transparent, but then also to be accountable with the money. And so everyone wants to know, you know, that there's no graph that every dollar is being used and the return is like, you know, 60, 70% fold. And it's, and we're still, I think government is always going to be challenged with how to do that in a way that's still streamlined and efficient and also doesn't simultaneously kick people out. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that that's what happens. And so generally the only folks who stay in or get in are those that have pre-existing relationships with folks or who have the capacity and the infrastructure to kind of manage through and find their way in. Um, and so we will continue to need help 
from organizations and associates from businesses like yours and associations like this to to figure out how to thread the needle because of course you want the dollars to go where they're supposed to go but you also have to recognize that you can't tie everyone's hands and feet and blindfold them and then say hey here do all of this yeah. um and you know government tends to respond to anecdote um and you know you hear stories about fraud or bad stuff. And then the next thing you know, you've got 15 bills popping up that are all about cracking down on that. And it may be a small percentage of the issues that are, you know, challenging, but it gets a lot of spotlight. Mm -hmm. And needing to partner more and more consistently with our business partners to help folks understand that it's, it may, it may not be as prolific as people think, or there might be non-legislative ways to tackle it is as important because I swear I think we have too many bills um, on the books um, and they, you have these regulations and not everyone knows about them and not everyone knows about compliance or not everyone knows when it comes to procurement all of the steps that you um, you know have to go through or the hoops you have to jump through and many folks you know just don't understand um, how we hamper. And so just wanting to say that to let you know that I understand and I hear you and, and want to be able to build on this relationship, especially through the caucus, so that we can elevate these concerns, because I don't think a lot of folks in the administration get it. I just want to, I want to thank you. I want to thank the folks like Debbie, you know, because again, because you have experience and you're reasonable, I think my personal opinion is that finally, I think this whole public private partnership across the board with the government will help. Because I think that when you look at RFPs and contracts and these bills, a lot of this stuff is from the fifties and the sixties and the seventies. Systems have not been upgraded, so they can't pivot quick enough. And then, so they keep that those same historical documents and just pile on, pile on, pile on. But it's individuals like yourself that can come in and say, you know what, I've, I've filled out this application. I've talked to somebody about this. I've seen this for myself. We need to clean this up and we need to look more like what private sector does. Because at the end of the day, it's just business. It's government business and it's public business, I mean, pr private business. But at the end of the day, this is still just business. It's still just procurement. It's still just contracting. And so we all know that certainly at some point, um, a lot of this stuff was to pile on in order to keep people misinformed so that they get frustrated because they don't have the infrastructure to carry it, blah, 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 blah. The, you know, again, this is my big soapbox about how can we help, what can we do to preclude some of the angst that a, an organization like PCR that's out here trying to really, 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 really work with folks, but they got to jump through 59 hoops just to get $50,000 and they got to do $50,000 worth of work just to keep the money, you know? <laughs> right. And so again, I, I just thank you. I thank the, I thank what I call the new blood. I, I look at you guys and I'm excited about it and I'm here to help and we're here to help because we know that we, we're not talking about for our benefit. We're talking about for our next generations and they're not taking it. They're not taking it laying down. So we have to help bridge that gap so that we don't lose any momentum. So thank you for coming on today, Debbie. Thank you for your wonderful insight. And we will, we, we look forward to working with you guys. We really do. Me thank too. you so much. Thank you. I'm going to have to jump thank off in a minute. Yeah. Like Stephen Turner said, are there any plans for you running for the U S and or the California Senate? <laughs> After yesterday, huh? That's a good question. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, as y'all know, Alex Padilla was appointed um, the U.S. Senator. I was certainly one of the folks that signed on to the letter um, about keeping the seat African-American. So we're going to keep pressing in case there's an opportunity for a second appointment. We know we have one other senator um, who actually doesn't, isn't up for election until 2024. Um, but there, you never know, there might be an opportunity. And so we have a number of amazing folks that, um, you know, we agree as the Black Caucus who should be appointed. But I am running for the California State Senate, yes, C30. Fantastic. Well, we will definitely be behind you. We think you're absolutely awesome. Thank you this so much. This is Cheryl Turner. Hi, this Cheryl. is Cheryl Turner. And hi, um, you know, I'm a member and I'm also running for that seat. 
we both are. So I just want everyone to know that. Okay. Um, I also have a quick question about the rental housing industry. Um, as you know, I have a great deal of concern about the small mom and pop, mostly black and brown owners who are trying to maintain their investments. That's bizarre. When I come back in, I can see you, and then it freaks me out because <laughs> then I turn to my screen. Okay. I'm sorry. As I said, I'm juggling. I'm juggling two different. I'm juggling two different uh, zooms. But uh, yeah, what are you? What are the plans for helping small rental owners to pay their mortgages when the state has put a moratorium on them, their ability to collect rent, which they need to pay their those mortgages and other bills. So AB 3088 was a bill that was passed last year, which was the eviction moratorium bill that was uh, to both support tenants and also um, homeowners and uh, small mom and pop landlords. It's very hard for the state to negotiate sort of federal um, uh, banking requirements and regulations, although we have done a lot to um, connect with uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who chairs the Banking and Finance Committee on the federal side. But in that bill, there were um, agreements around having banking institutions <clears throat> working, working in concert with folks around sort of forbearance um, workarounds mm -hmm. so that that didn't happen right in processes. And so AB 15 and AB 16 have been authored that would also extend the eviction moratorium. And uh, I've also signed on to a $5 billion request for uh, renter and um, um, small mom and pop landlord relief, because we know that um, you know if tenants can't pay the rent, that means that landlords can't pay the mortgage. And if that happens, then everybody is out. Um, and so there's a concerted effort um, by both the legislature and I believe the governor to make sure that we can support both of those groups because they are inextricably tied. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, thank thank you, you guys. everyone. Before right. everyone, uh, we do appreciate everyone that 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 is following on us that that attend that come out every week to week, and uh, we so appreciate your support. Um, also, recycling black dollars. I think I've mentioned to everyone we are taking our resource guide digital. And so we are going to have a listing on the digital platform of every black business in the greater Los Angeles and the outskirts of Los Angeles. So there is a link in the chat. Please go on there and complete that and complete your information. And in addition, that's just a, a link. That's just a listing in the guide. But we would love to have you advertise your business in the guide. There We have a $200 special membership combo offer right now uh, that will give you a half a page ad in the resource guide, the print copy, and as well as a interactive link on the digital platform. We want to make sure that we don't, I get calls and emails regularly on how do I find a plumber? How do I find this? Where do I find this? Where do I find that? And can you recommend someone? I can't recommend them if I don't know they exist. So uh, share that with everyone that you know that that's a business owner. We really truly want to support our black businesses. It's imperative in the place that we are right now that even if we're not in our brick and mortars, we have to be able to support our own community in order to keep us economically sound. So uh, I, I would appreciate if you share that with everyone. And um, if you're interested in getting the, the, the uh, $200 membership a special membership and an ad combo. You can go to our art to our website, which is rbdmedia.org, and you can sign up there. Um, you can get the specifications. Just reach out to me on what your ad size needs to be. But we can't support you if we don't know you ex don't exist. But we truly want everyone. The listing is completely free. Um, and this is a, a, an effort between the Los Angeles Urban League and the and Recycling Black Dollars. Um, we we um, are com we believe in collaboration, so we can do more when we work together. So I want to thank everyone. 
uh, for for coming out and um, fantastic information from Assembly uh, Member Sydney. Thank you, Jamie, for helping us coordinate that. Uh, thank you, Debbie, for um, for participating. Thank you, Cheryl. And um, I'm done. You guys, uh, Robin and Greg. And this is this is a great kickoff for 2021, and I'm excited about where this is going to go. And I'm excited about the the information that we heard today. You know, it's it's critically important that we have like-minded individuals on this show. And 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 she, those two ladies in particular, I I know I know Debbie well. They've done a they they got stripes on their back. So it's our job to help protect them so that they can continue to do what they do. So again, thank you. This is wonderful. All righty, Stephen. You good? Great. <laughs> <He's out. laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Have a great week and um, be safe, mask up, social distance. We are in a surge right now and I really want to see everyone every month. So I don't want you to get sick. I've, I've had so many people uh, close to me that has been um, COVID positive and, and struggling. So uh, please be safe. This is, it's a real deal. All righty. Mm -hmm. So we'll see you next week. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.